today. So welcome to week two. How did you like week one? Is there anything you'd like to see different or did what was something you liked about week one? I see you thinking. Do I have a shy group here? So I we'll think every week was great. Okay, thank you. And you, Jillian? I think every week should be like week one. There was minimal work, very easy discussion. It was beautiful. Okay, all right. And do you like the <laughs> cahoots? Uh, I don't think we ended up playing Kahoot last. Oh, you weren't able to that one. Oh, so you get yeah. this week. So we're going to have fun today with it. Were you able to go back and look at the recording? Yes. Because it is there. I'm telling you the cahoots are important because you're going to see concepts that are going to be on exams. Hint. You're going to see ex uh, concepts on the HESI. Hint. So they're very important things. I like to make sure I cover stuff. And the way I make sure is, you know, in PowerPoint and lecturing, there's so much you get in that you'll understand, but you throw these little incidental type of concepts in, in a cahoots question, it just works better. Okay. And it's more time, it's not less time consuming for y'all and less time you have to spend with me. So today, um, this week, week two, we're going over infants. Uh, toddlers and preschoolers, I think they're my favorite ages. It's just so much is going on with them and they're growing and developing and it is uh, fun to watch. Uh, quiz one is open till Sunday night and there is a discussion question this week. So make sure that you do answer it. Now you're gonna see your discussion questions from last week. I read all of them. And what I saw in general, not everybody, so don't take it personal if you didn't, I didn't see a reference for the second part of the question, or some didn't even do the second part, um, or there wasn't a citation in the middle of the body of a paragraph that showed me that reference in there. And I put an example there for you. So as we do discussion questions, I will continue to show you what you're not doing. And if anybody wants, I can just pop on Zoom before, after class and show you a quick, what I, what do I expect? Okay, very simply. Okay, so let's start with our PowerPoint. Then we're gonna go to our cahoots. So let's go here. I had some issues with the timing that I had never understood before that Monday's class helped me through. So I hope that it is fixed. So, infant. This is Bogart. Yes. I have a question about the Kahoot. I'm sorry. Um, sure. I tried to play it, but I guess I can't play it by myself. You can't I, go I, and just look at it. No, I tried doing the link, and uh, it was like invite your teammates or whatever. <laughs> I couldn't look um, at it. Has anybody else tried yet? Yeah, I had that same issue. It just kind of lists the um it did, it did it the doesn't. list the questions and the answers um you can only see part of the question you can't see the whole question really but yeah you can't play it by yourself no mm -hmm. all right i couldn't you even know, see any questions yeah okay, let me call kahoot you know i spend money on that for you also i will call them and i will let you know how to do that okay if it's possible if not do you have another email another device a phone and a computer you could play it to yourself if need be. I mean, that's the, immediately what popped up in my mind. Okay, so let's try that too. So infancy through preschoolers. Now infants go through so much. That first year of life, they go from seven pounds, triple their weight, 21 pounds. They have gone from not being able to hold up their head to be able to run. And that is part of the central nervous system. They're talking about, you know, the reflexes building and the reflexes that, you know, make muscles move and then getting more coordination as we're getting up and standing up and sitting up and walking. That's all the central nervous system that is growing so quickly. So 
we know at birth they're born at seven pounds but they'll lose 10 percent. that's just because as i think they're floating in amniotic fluid water so they absorb it so they usually when they come back from the nursery and they've urinated two or three times the baby already the, the face and the puffy in the eyes already has disappeared so double weight by six months triple weight by uh one year and the height is not as important to, to follow. Mostly it's the weight we look at. And it's like a step stool. You'll see the baby get fatter, the height will be stable, then all of a sudden the baby gets taller and the baby will look thinner. They get a little pudgier and then the baby gets thinner. And this goes all through up into you know school age almost. I sent you that vital sign sheet which shows you that at birth, infants have a heart rate, respiratory rate of 40 to 60, 140 to 160. And that's at rest, that's without crying. But as we get older by one year, your heart rate can be 100 and your respiratory rate can be 25, 26, which is normal. So you see how it slows down, becomes more efficient. Plus you're getting bigger, so you have more volume there too. Important things that happen to infants is that at birth, mom gives all these invaluable things to the baby, gives them their blood, what their blood count is, their immune system is all given to that baby, but that baby doesn't start making its own cells up to like three to six months, but closer to six months. So what does that mean? That means these children are becoming more and more susceptible to disease, and their hemoglobins and hematocrits are dropping. So it's not unusual to have a six month old with a 10 and 30 hemoglobin hematocrit because they are just starting to make their own cells. And unless they're symptomatic, we're gonna do nothing with it. Now, it does mean that their iron levels are lower and it does mean their oxygen levels are lower. So maybe they're um, tire out easier and uh, because of that. And we'll probably give some iron supplements for that. At birth, you're born with two soft spots, one in the front, fontanelle it's called, and one in the back, um, which is your anterior posterior. And they close at different times. And the reason why we know this, very important, is to check them to see, have they closed by six to eight weeks? Or is it 16 weeks and it still hasn't closed? Why hasn't it closed? That means the brain needed that space. Why did it need that space? Is it extra fluid in the brain or maybe a tumor could be grown? Something's not right. So knowing these uh, developmental things um, makes us go and check something before it becomes a problem, hopefully. Their ears, their eyes become more and more. They can see more. They can hear mommy. They know who mommy is at this time. As I said, the central nervous system grows really quick. You know, we have a child who number one grows, okay? So, and they start running um, by the age of uh, 12 months, most likely. But also we're in a child who could barely suck, swallow and breathe at birth, who now is putting blocks, towers of two, right? By one years old, you know, and reaching out and mama, dada starting to know. So their cognition, their behavior, they understand and they know what behaviors get mommy and daddy there too as part of the theorists that we're gonna go into. So the first year of life, the, the whole immune system does mature. That's why we give immunizations at two, four, six months. We want to get those bad diseases covered you know, for that baby, because you already have, you know, upper respiratory infections and things they can get, you know, normally. So we, that's why we give them so close together. Now, they say that breast milk continually gives those um, antigens and antibodies that this baby needs through the first year of life. So it, it is absolutely recommended that we do um, give those uh, up to one year. One thing with infants, they're born, and if you put them in a cold room, they're going to get cold immediately. Not just because they're wet from coming, you know, just out, but just because their body does not um, take care of itself holding its heat like we can. So what does that mean for us? Well, at birth, these children need to be covered up or put under a warmer immediately. And we need to monitor that temperature really closely because it cannot regulate itself at all. 
at birth, they are, um, if they get cold, they're going to be start to shivering. They're going to, you know, get rid of whatever heat they have there. Also, again, you have all of this extra fluid, like I said, that 10% extracellular fluid that needs to come out of these children. Any baby can't warm that also. The renal function at birth, as infants, they should be a minimum of 0 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour. Everything in pediatrics is milligrams per kilogram, micrograms per kilogram. We always determine dosages and all things like this according to the kilograms of weight. So in pediatrics, you're gonna see children, they're not gonna be 44 pounds, they're gonna be 20 kilograms. It's because we use this conversion with most everything we do for children. So if we see a child not urinating appropriately, of course, the baby's oliguric and we'll call the physician. Now at birth for the first six months, the baby GI system is very mature, which means only breast milk and only iron fortified formula should be given, nothing else. Because the GI system can't use it, doesn't know what to do to dissolve it, to absorb it. So it just all just comes out in the stool. So they eat something in their mouth that's not, you know, the milks, boom, it comes right out and it will be in the stool. And all you're doing is causing probably some GI discomfort for the infant. That's why we start introducing food at six months old and very slowly to our infants. So we were talking fine motor, gross motor, and there's differences in what this is because you'll get questions talking about fine motor skills and questions regarding gross motor skills. Well, think of fine F fingers. What do you do with your hands? Simple, right? You're gonna remember that. So the first thing they do is the baby holds his hand out and of course mommy puts her finger in it and that little infant just closes it. That is a reflex palmer grasp. It's the first thing they do, it's a reflex. And of course, all parents go, oh, my baby just gave my, my finger a hug. Isn't that sweet? And yes, it is. And I'll never tell them that it was this involuntary reflex that went on. I'll let them think that. Now, you will see children go from the um, reflex to the voluntary and then into pincer grasp. And these are about the months. So you have it, you just close it, you know, involuntarily reflex. Then it's a voluntary, you want it. And then you're gonna put it between hands and that's at seven months. And then you start with the pincer. Now it's not pincer, this is a fine pincer. Usually it's just the whole hand coming down, you know, and swooshing like Cheerios or Puffet things, you know, in their mouth. Um, so that's about 10 months old, they can do that. Then they can take things out of a container and then they could build blocks, two of them by age one year. This is this fine motor skills is, you know, measuring cognition. You know, are they getting enough nutrition? Are there, is their cognition okay? Is there something we need to do for this child? So I gave you a little uh, PowerPoint, an extra slide for you to test yourself. So gross mode, gross motor, I think of get up and go, right? G, gross, get up and go, anything with movement. So the first thing an infant does is pick their head up. Then they'll roll over from their abdomen to their back and back to abdomen. So by six months old, an infant should be able to turn completely over. That means you're gonna be teaching safety things for your parents because now they can roll off the couch onto the floor. They can roll off the changing table to the floor. I mean, they always should have been strapped in, but exactly now is even more important at six months because they can really turn. At eight months, they should be able to sit up unsupported. No pillows on the side, not you holding them. They can sit there by then. And then they can go from prone up to sitting about 10 months. So these are developmental motor stages. Now, some of them don't get there quietly at the time. Sometimes they don't run, go from their abdomen to the back. They start with back to abdomen, but as long as they're moving forward, the, the baby's okay. So nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. 
Nutrition is the most important thing we can do for our infant because nutrition helps our body grow and our minds get strong. And we can see this with these cognitions and doing things with their fingers and gross motor skills and they're going the right direction. They got good cognition that they're getting plenty of good nutrition. So the first six months is either mom's milk or iron fortified formula. That's it. After that, we start um, putting in other types of foods. Uh, we'll start it one at a time, three to five days in between, because infants can have allergies to them. And it could be a rash, it could be itching, or redness, it could be something. So something will change and you will see it. Breastfeeding, we know that it's eight to 10 minutes each side. I mean, parents who've breastfed know when one side gets soft, you know, switch to the other, but the book is eight to 10 minutes. As I said, weight loss is 10% after birth because they're floating in this amniotic fluid. And then they start gaining weight really, really quickly. It's like a half an ounce a day for the first two months, which is quite a lot. So the baby needs new, 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 good nutrition. And you'll always see parents asking, especially a breastfed uh, baby, is my baby getting enough? I don't know if they're getting enough. I can't measure it. I don't know how many ounces. And all you tell them is that if the baby has six to eight wet diapers a day, your baby is getting plenty of liquid, plenty of breast milk. So as we go to that second six months, you know, most physicians will start with your cereals, your rice, your oats, you know, and go that way. Some of them want to start with fruit, some vegetables. The only thing with it is that you start introducing other foods. Now you can start weaning from breast. Now you can start decreasing the amount of formula that a baby takes because they are getting nutrition another way. And it is one new item every three to five days. And then you can introduce another one. Dental health, you don't think of dental health with baby. You just look and say, wow, the baby has two teeth. Well, they do recommend just a wet washcloth and to um, just wipe the teeth before they go to bed at night because you shouldn't have a uh, bottle in there uh, of anything uh, at bedtime is what we um, pediatricians will tell you. So no toothpaste at initially, okay? We start some fluoride about six months. Now, not all children do get teeth at six months and that's okay. Um, I had uh, two children and I remember my daughter, no teeth, no teeth, 15 months old. She broke six teeth at the same time. Talk about a cranky little girl, it really hurt, but it doesn't matter as long as you can feel they're almost there, they're going forward. If it had gone much longer, I would have gone to a pediatric dentist because that was long. Because usually you will take the number of months of a child's age and minus six, and that's how many teeth they should have. But not all children are the same, okay? You know, pacifiers have been this thing. You'll hear some people say they're bad, some are good. And I've seen it go back and forth three different times. But now they're recommending a pacifier with back to sleep. It is self-soothing. Uh, they recommend it for procedures because it decreases pain. Um, so pacifier is a, a good thing. And it, if you use the ones that are orthodontic, that you could keep those straight being, those teeth being straight. Infants do sleep a lot. They usually sleep nine to 11 hours. Breastfed babies um, tend to feed every two to three hours. And you will see that the formula babies usually go three to four hours. And that's just normal for breastfed. And they will be napping during the day. It could be two, three naps, hour nap, two hour naps, whatever. And they don't recommend walkers and swings and play pens at this time that um, they're for when they get older. These are the immunizations. What I want you to know about these is number one, never give a live vaccine to anybody immunosuppressed. That includes a child who is on a steroid, okay? And the first vaccine that they give is hepatitis B. And that's given in the hospital or at the first visit. And why do they do it either way? I have no clue. All I can think is maybe it's insurance reimbursement. I don't know. But these are the other vaccines we give. 
know that they're every two, four, six months initially, and then it will be 15 to 18 months. I don't go into asking you all of the different months of this. Just know that, you know, we're giving them and why? Because there is no immune system on these infants by six months old. They have to build their own because mommies will be gone. I think colic is one of the most difficult things to have. Um, colic is a infant who is crying, crying, crying. They're unconsolable and they're in pain. Their legs are going, you can see their face grimacing and it's all due to gas of some sort or intolerance maybe to the formulas. And it's frustrating because parents lose sleep They've been in and out of doctors, changing formulas, going to GI. It, it's just exhausting to tell you the minimum about a colicky baby. So colic, we can hopefully try to help a parent with this, but let's say you're in the doctor's office and you have a mother uh, calling up and the baby's little, six to eight weeks old. And they're saying, my baby's crying like eight hours at a time. And um, I can't do anything to maybe have the baby stop. I've rocked, I've this and that. Well, what can I give them? Well, no, you need to come into this doctor's office now. Let's see what's going on because we can't always assume that it's just colic, right? Could be something else. And infants do get other GI issues. Another thing that we see in infancy is failure to thrive. Failure to thrive is the baby's not getting enough nutrition, not gaining weight, not the proper pounds or anything for some reason. Um, it could be as simple as they have reflux and they spit up most of their formula, so they're not getting nutrition. Or it could be some absorption problem, or it could be an allergy, or it could be metabolic. So failure to thrive is when you have an infant at, let's say at eight months old, who is still eight pounds, okay? That's a little small. So failure to thrive needs a complete workup, finding out what, how do we feed this infant? Because remember the cognition that's formed, the central nervous system, what it has to go through now, it really needs the nutrition. Some of the things that happen to infants uh, today because we're back to sleep to prevent SIDS is a flat back of their head. And many uh, parents say, well, what do I do to prevent that? Well, you can get a helmet put on like the one there on the bottom, but that tends to be time consuming and you don't really need to do that for these flat heads anymore. What the pediatricians say is turn them over on their abdomen while they're wide awake and do tummy time. And these infant scalps are so soft, they tend to remold every time you do that. Um, and, and you'll see that by the time they get to be one, you know, and they're not on their uh, back all the time that you're gonna see their heads rounding out. Then you have the severe ones, which of course you can get the helmets. Another thing is cradle cap. Kids are born with this crusty white stuff in their scalp and you know, the parents want a magic, you know, boom, it's gone. Well, it's not like that. What we recommend is like mineral oil or soap and water, clean it and a fine soft comb, tooth comb or brush, okay? Very fine and softly. We're not going to vigorously do anything on that scalp because you'll break that skin open very, very easily. And then there's dermatitis. Um, I think diaper rash is one of the uh, hardest things um, on an infant because they urinate and they scream because it burns. So finding out what was it, go, is it like because they've had diarrhea like crazy? Okay, but it just happened for no reason. Um, it could be a new diaper, it could be a new soap, a new cream, it could be a new food you introduced they didn't like. So usually it turns out to be a yeast, we'll put some, um, powder on there, the nice statin, and we'll tell you to leave them open to air and change the diaper as frequently as you can. So, but um, when you have the diaper rash like that, it, it suffers the poor little baby. I mentioned a little bit about SIDS. SIDS is, you know, we don't know, all of a sudden the baby dies in their sleep. So uh, risk factors, well, the baby could have just been sick with a little upper respiratory infection or something or males more than females. 
Um, of course, anything in the cribs, overdressing, overheating, blankets, pillows, none of that stuff, no smoking in the house. So, and of course, prematurity is another one for that. So SIDS, um, we have put them on their back. We have found that uh, we've decreased the amount of them. So I was involved in a study at um, Nicholas Children's Hospital in Miami, and it proved it. As we started this back to sleep, you could see the numbers come down. That's a good thing. So all T or an apparent life-threatening event, something that can happen to an infant, Usually uh, what I have seen is the baby chokes on formula, holds his breath, holds his breath, turns blue, and then starts crying. So, and the, you know, they have to smack the back to get those babies uh, breathing. And they bring the children into the doctor's office or urgent care or ER. Oh my God, my baby turned blue, oh my goodness. Um, sometimes it's just a GI problem. Sometimes it's not, but they do a workup on these children. Why did that happen? So it's like this choking event. We call them all T's. And then they're going to get like the, um, everything done to check on them. Many of them go home with this apnea monitor. And I hope you have a chance to see one. It's so easy to use. It's just a Velcro strap that you attach, which has two leads underneath the strap. It attaches to this monitor. You set alarms for what you want high and low, and it is a piercing sound when it's too uh, high or it's too low. And it again, that has also saved many of children after they got home. So Letitia is a breastfed infant being seen at the clinic for her six month checkup. Her nurse tells, her mother tells the nurse that Letitia recently began to suck her thumb, which of the following is the best intervention. So six month old sucking her thumb. See, see, it's absolutely normal. And remember, infants, oral, everything in the mouth, they suck, they chew, they bite. This is self-soothing. This calms infants down. So maybe something's bothering this child. And there we go. It's going to be, she'll take care of herself. So we're going to go over some of these theorists within your um, stuff today. Now, I did send you a great um, handout on the theorist. I sent it in the inbox. I hope you all have it. If you don't, check your inboxes in Canvas. That's where I put it. Um, I sent it the same time I sent the recording. So that's your timestamp. So Erickson, probably the most widely tested theorist that you see in any of your exams. Um, Erickson, as an infant, is trust versus mistrust. And what does that mean? So you don't just need to know what the words are. You need to know what trust and mistrust is. So trust is they believe that all their needs are going to be met. They know when they're coming and they know they're being met. I cry, mom comes, I'm wet, she changes me, I'm hungry. She feeds me, I need a burp, I'm burped. I'm trusting everything I need, you give me. What is mistrust? That is that infant who for whatever reason takes a long time for somebody to get them what they need. So they're left in a dirty diaper, they're left hungry, they're left fending for themselves. And this happens in some situations. It could be abuse or it could just be a huge family. Who knows? But you know, sometimes it happens, but it's not just once. This, this is like repeated types that you do see there. So Piaget, Piaget, sensory motor, sense, touch, feelings. What does it feel like? Oral, mouth, everything in the mouth, bite, chew, suck. This is in the mouth and then motor. Let me take it and fly it up around my head, okay? Let me see it where it is, okay? So we're using all of these reflexes that uh, are part of the sensory or motor. We're imitating, we're playing. I mean, ever take a little two or three month old and look at them and go, stick your tongue out, blah, 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 and all of a sudden they try to stick their tongue. Well, this is a little infant, but they do. They start the imitation. 
or you start making noises and they die, blah, 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 they're trying to talk to you. These are all things which are part of what Piaget is cognitive development, doing those things to them. So, you know, it is a coordination of, I can see what you're doing, now I can imitate, okay? Or I can see something and play with it. So it starts that cognitive, taking that information, as it says here about a schema, organizes it, which means puts it so I don't understand it, and then you're interpreting. So if you see something going on that you can repeat it. Now, object permanence, we talked about a toy, let's say a rattle on an eight month old, you take them, and it could be a little bit younger than that too, but put it underneath something or behind something, you know, where they're playing and the baby knows it's still there. Now, mom doesn't have to be there, so they can go around and find it, you know, and find the toy. So even though it's not in sight, it's still there. That's object permanence. They know you put his toy truck in the toy chest. They know tomorrow morning when he gets up, that truck will be in the toy chest because that's object permanence, okay? They start to understand movement and feeling of things. And then they're starting to look at themselves a little bit more and understanding who they are and making faces. There is social development because it's not just about mom and dad or whoever is raising this child, mom and mom or grandma and daughter. It is now other people are going to be there. So it could be the doctor, it could be, you know, a friend, a family member. So they are becoming attached to the main caregivers. Um, so they don't want to be pulled away. You start to see um, this, what we call separation anxiety uh, between four to eight months. And they don't wanna be too much away from mom and dad. Sometimes you can give your little baby, you know, to let's say your girlfriend and walk away and all of a sudden can't see you, the baby starts crying. That's separation anxiety. And then stranger fear is when other people come up, the doctor, the nurse, and they want, you know, to do something and they really, will cling back to mom and dad. But they're gonna start looking over the shoulder about nine months old, peeking, and that's what that means. They start with crying and cooing initially. That's their language development. And then it goes on to getting those first words by one year old. Um, everybody wants mommy first or daddy first. It's just, you know, whatever the baby does. They're gonna be playing in their own ways, switching a rattles from one side to the other at seven months. This is play, this is that sensory motor in the mouth, touching, feeling around type things. And we can measure a temperament on an infant. There is a questionnaire um, that is able to do that. So toddlers, I call these my dive bomb children. Uh, these dive bomb children are the terrible twos. This is ages 12 to 36 months or one to three. This is where they're checking out the environment um, all the time. They are in everything, in every corner, putting everything in the mouth. This is the time of they don't want to do what you want to do. So this is that temper tantrum. And that's that no, 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 me do, me do, me do, no, no, okay? I love this Jerry Seinfeld quote. Having a two-year-old is like having a blender without a lid. They're everywhere and it's hard to keep up with them. So we've gained a lot of weight the first year, right? Well, it slows down now. Only four to six pounds during this time is what you'll see per year, okay? So um, the height gets bigger and now the legs are getting longer. Initially, you saw the trunk was longer and shorter legs. Well, now the legs are gonna catch up with the trunk. And again, they get pudgy, they grow taller. They get pudgy, they get taller. It's the stair step, the pudgy, taller, pudgy, taller. And that head should be equal to, or it should be now less than the chest. If it's not, again, very important marker that we can measure that head because um, we can find out, is there something we've missed as an infant? 
Their systems, of course, are more and more mature. These um, heart rate, everything starts coming down according to their age. This is the age of these upper respiratories, ear infections and tonsils. Well, think about this age, one to three, everything in their mouth, right? They're swapping spit, they're sharing spit. They don't know not to touch things, things in their mouth, viruses go all over. And this is not a bad thing actually, because what is this child doing? They're building their immune system. So by the time they get to kindergarten, hopefully that they will have built a really strong immune system. Because I think toddler, most parents every other week or at least once a month, they're in the doctor's office. Something's going on, they need something else for them. We also know these children at some point will be able to control their, their urine or their bowels. There's gross motor and then there's fine motor, okay? So when you talk about gross motor, you're talking about they're getting more coordinated. At one, they're sort of still waddling when they walk. By their age three, they can run pretty well straight ahead. They can now use you know, their arms well, they can start to color a little better. And then by 18 months, they can throw a ball. And watch out, my grandson hit me right in the head with one. Their visual acuity um, becomes more and more clear. So as infants, we still know it was foggy, they could see, but it wasn't completely developed. Well, now it's getting there very much so. So they do have a depth perception, but um, as they're, they don't have the motor capability to keep up with these falls that could happen. So they can see that it's far away down there, but they can't react quick enough to protect themselves, okay? Their hearing, smell, taste, touch, they're completely developed. These children end up not wanting anything to eat, but things like macaroni and cheese and chicken nuggets because they don't want to eat um, carrots or this or that. You know, I, I was very blessed with my grandson. He loves broccoli, he loves salads, he loves cucumbers, he loves fruits better than anything else but um, macaroni and cheese sometimes, but they become picky, but they don't need much to eat. This is the age of physiologic anorexia, There's, which means they're not eating, but they eat little bits. And then one day they eat a lot, you know, for a couple of days and they only eat a little bit. This is absolutely normal for your toddlers. They're using all of their five senses and sight and hearing and taste looking, exploring again, exploring. So Erickson, Piaget, talking about these good old toddlers. As I said, they are the no, 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 no. Shame versus doubt. Now, I want you to know that shame um, is what they can't do. And the doubt is they don't know if they can, but they're going to try anyway. So negativism is that no, no, no. They like to be on a schedule, rituals. They like rituals where they want to wake up and then, you know, have their breakfast and get changed and go outside and watch TV and wash their hands, have lunch. They want basically the same thing. They really do well there. Now, this is why a toddler is very hard to take on vacation because, you know, vacations, it's thrown out of the water and you can't get them to sleep and, you know, they're cranky. It's because they want their rituals. It's what they thrive on. It gives them comfort. You know, they're understanding right and wrong sort of uh, at this time. Piaget, again, we're working more with their sensory and motor preoccupational phase. And it's what we call the tertiary circular, circular reactions. What they do is now they're taking the mud, putting it in water, trying to put it into a, you know, a house or something. They're trying to take a piece of something and make it work. You know, they're now attempting not only to know that it touches you, put water in it, now you're shaping it and doing other things to make it there. They're getting really, really creative, um, really um, good critical thinking. So autonomy versus shame and doubt. So here we go. When we talk toddlers, this uh, what we call shame is talking about you have parents, 
who don't allow the kid to jump off the couch to hit the other chair because they're afraid they're going to fall and hurt themselves. So they never get a chance to do it. That's a restrictive parent. Unless it will hurt them, let them dive bomb off the couch or maybe put a blanket or a towel down, you know, if you feel better, let him do it. Okay. And when he doesn't, he'll never do it again. Okay. Let them do the task that they can do. Take your bowl and put it in the sink. Take your shoes and put them by the front door. They love things that they can do. They love to please. But the hardest part, and I've always had a trouble with it, let them do something. Let them um, try, unless it's something that could really harm them, okay? I know I was sitting here watching my grandson. Uh, he was two, I believe. And he was on top of the couch, on top of a box, on top of the couch, and wanted to jump over to the other chair. And I said to my husband, I don't think it's a good idea. He says, well, he knows how to fall, let him do it. Because he taught him how to put his hands up as if he was gonna fall down. So he did it and he popped his head and I got the ice, but he never did it again. So this is that restrictive parents. And I know we're all, we all do it. It's just part of what we do. We have to protect our little ones. So the sensory motor is all about things that you do, which is pleasurable. Sucking your thumb is very pleasurable. Okay, having a response, you shake the rattle and now you've got a, a, a little shake coming up there. And then tertiary, through the cup or whatever on the floor because I know mom's gonna come over because I know mom has to come back out of the kitchen. Why did she leave? I want mommy here. All right, she left, boom, sippy cup on the ground. Who comes back? Mom, why did you do that? <laughs> Don't do that again. Boom, there it went again. It's because they want mommy back. So you have Piaget who just de describes this for you. So at this time, they're exploring their body parts, their genitals, they're looking. As parents, you know, if they're in public, say, yeah, don't do that here. You know, as they get older, we'll say, you know, that's private, go in the room, do it over there, I don't need to see you. You know, it shouldn't be something that's made that's bad, it's just something, there's a place for everything type thing. They start playing house and they're starting by age three, understanding mom and dad, male and female. Up to this point, they're just all kids. They're called girls and boys, but they still don't got that gender role, but now they're getting it. So they're starting to well, get away um, from what they know and they're starting to learn from other people because this is going to preschool, understanding what they need to do there or going to daycare, understanding what you need to do there. So it's becoming separated now from only the ideals that mommy has. The individual, it's what these children are. Um, we know some children you know, always have the bow in the hair and that's what makes them the special kid every day. Um, or it could be um, they know that this kid has for, uh, let's say it's, you know, the younger kid, um, toddler going, taking, you know, nap time, that he has his teddy bear he always has to have when he goes to sleep, or it could be the blanket that he needs. And these things make these children individual, but helps them tolerate what they have to do. They're starting to understand more and more every day. And the conversations are good if I could understand most of it, but they are attempting to talk to you. And they're trying to tell you, as you take time and slow them down, I've actually learned that they can say another word that describes what they're trying to say that I didn't understand. So you can do that with this age children, which I think is great. You know, it takes time to communicate, but these children really understand what's going on. You need to let them be independent, you know, let them feed themselves food, the spoon upside down, using their hands, whatever they're doing, but they're feeding themselves, okay? Very important thing to do. You know, after they eat, you know, wipe them down, give them a bath, whatever, you know, make sure you have a good bib on them, right? Let them play um, with, with their things. Also, let them try to dress. I think this starts to happen when they really start to potty train, you know, and now they've taken off their pull up or whatever, and they have a pair of shorts. They try to put their shorts on. 
I don't care if it's inside, outside, backwards, they tried. And the attempt was there and that is awesome and should be praised. And the one thing these toddlers at this age is that they start to understand feelings for other. I think this is very well described as a day that my knee was hurting really bad. I have rheumatoid arthritis. So I get times where something hurts. Well, it was hurt and I had ice on it. And my little grandson came over, gave my leg a hug and he kissed the ice bag and he said, all better. And he was a young kid and it wasn't prompted. This is something that he did. So, you know, toddlers can do that. So they're very concerned and they're pleasers. So they're getting more and more social with more kids able to get along. Um, they are uh, with good toys, they can really even expand more. And again, there's parallel play where they're next to each other, sort of doing the same thing, but not together. They're imitating what other kids are doing. And remember, it's that touch, that sensor or motor still. Toilet training, you can figure out when they're ready. Um, they start telling you, um, you know, that's a hard thing to do. But, you know, the one thing that I thought was neat and I used with my grandson, it was great, putting them backwards on the toilet. Because if not, their penis sticks out the front and they squirt the wall in front of them. So it's really cool. Turn them around and it goes down where it should go. And my kid thought that was pretty neat. So he was backwards on the toilet. So we made it fun. We didn't make it different. Temper tantrums, uh, all the time. Um, the one thing about temper tantrums, I know walking through the grocery store, they lay on the floor and they scream, I want, I want. Um, th the goal is to walk away. As long as they're not doing anything to harm themselves, walk away. Um, because once you acknowledge a temper tantrum, that's what he wanted. He wanted you, okay? And that's part of what, what the training, what, what um, the, the books and literature says. I've already said it's no, 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 me do, me do. They want to do things for themselves. They want to be, not be and want not to, don't want to need anybody to help them. And they're gonna make messes and they're gonna do things that hurt them, but that's what they want. Now, something happens in the family. Um, these children can regress and you will see them having a potty trained child, all of a sudden they're you know, incontinent. Um, you'll see them start sucking their thumb when they haven't or go grab the sister's pacifier, you know, want that blankie you know, from infancy. You'll see a kid regression. It's usually during stressful times. It could be, you know, daddy went away or Nana's not here anymore, something. Something went on, these kids will show you that way. So here's another thing um, regarding uh, fine motor and gross motors, and your answers are underneath. So when we talk about play, um, remember play is parallel play, imitation play, tactile play, and to use the appropriate toys all the time. A one-year-old should speak at least one word, one word sentence, mommy, daddy, maybe it's milk, maybe it's whatever, whatever they like. Two-year-old should be multi-sentence words, multi-words. And then of course, at that point, they can dress, undress, they can play, et cetera. So preschoolers, we made it. Beautiful age, ages three to five. Um, three to five is where they start going to school and being more on a structure. You know, there was daycare where there's some structure, but it's not as structured as would be preschool. We know that they need to be able to work with other children. They have to be able to follow directions and they need an increased uh, memory so that an attention span to follow the teacher and go through what the day is all about. Again, we're not really, really gaining a lot of weight these years. It's, it has slowed down. And, you know, at this age, these children uh, can tolerate more stress. They're more resilient than a toddler. You know, that toddler needs all that rituals and needs things just a certain way. Well, you can mix it up for these children. They're not, they're more tolerant. That's what that means. So gross motor, get up and go, go, go. They can walk, run, jump well, jump on one foot well, doing great that way. Fine motor, hand to hand, dressing, drawing, 
buttoning up a button, you know, age four. So their fine motors getting better and they're becoming more and more active and get up and go. So Ericsson is a sense of initiative. And this is where they start to learn from what do they do? And they know the difference of doing it right and wrong, okay? Um, and they know that there is a consequence for a right. They get good consequence and wrong, a bad one. Um, sometimes they do something and it wasn't good. They feel sort of guilty and they get afraid that something's gonna happen to them. No, I didn't do it. No, 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 mommy, I didn't do it. I didn't mean to, it was an accident, right? So that's that feeling of that fear um, because they do have that conscience and because they know right and wrong moral development. Now, cognitively, they're getting ready for school. Um, these children here start to be more aware at this age of their environment, that there are different people, different people that do different things, um, understanding um, the colors of the skin, languages. They're starting to see this and they're starting to listen what other people say and say, but Santiago said that, da, 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 da. and that's my grandson's uh, favorite friend, you know, or Maria said, da, 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 da. So I'm hearing it all the time, you know, that, that, that other people's opinions matter. I mean, especially the teacher. Well, my teacher said, <laughs> And their language, oh my goodness, at this age, it is getting better and better. And they really uh, can articulate well that you're understanding and you don't need them to repeat the word 10 times before you get it. They know that if they do something wrong, something's gonna happen. There's gonna be a, something happen, a casualty or you know, a punishment for it. They do not know what time is yet. They know that after you get out of school, we're leaving to go to grandma's. When you wake up in the morning, we're, uh, you need to get ready for school. Or after lunch, we'll go to the pool. They understand events for time, okay? And again, magical, magical thinking. They are creating things in their brains and toys. And you know, they go off into another space. You know, my grandson is always taking a video of what he's doing in real life and he's going to post it on YouTube. <laughs> I'm like, okay, okay, watch it. He likes YouTube videos like kids at this age do. Kohlberg. Now, Kohlberg is the absolute, there's good and there's bad and there is a good consequence and there is a bad consequence. He's the one talks about moral absolutely moral and behaving. And um, if he something happens that he has a punishment, it has to be a fair punishment. So it is Kohlberg, right? Wrong, with a consequence. So at this age, children have that bond with the opposite sex parent. So my grandson, it's mommy, okay? And all I have is grandsons. So it is always the woman for the boy and it's always the girl, the girl with the um, daddy. And that is usually the bond that you do see. At this time, they don't want you to watch them get undressed to go into the shower, the bathtub. Nope, and they're like, you know, get out, don't look if they're in a ladies room. They are understanding sex roles. So they're dressing up like mommy or daddy. Again, their sex exploration continues. Uh, they're feeling and touching. They're asking questions and, you know, you say it's a penis and it's a vagina, you know, and that's what they know. They don't know it right or bad. And now they're finding out why is mommy pregnant? Had that happen? That rituals and negativism, like I told you, starts to go away. You know, they are more, they can, you know, mend and go with the flow at this point. They can dress themselves. They can button their shirts by age four. This child wants to please. Um, and he really knows about the family and a lot of their cultures. Um, at this age, my grandson knows that there's Christmas and he's getting a present and there's gonna be a tree, you know, and he goes to church. I mean, these things he knows because it's happened before and he's remembering. 
they do all the time, you know, challenge your code of conduct. You had your bath, got your jammies on, you're ready for bed. 10 more minutes, please. 10 more minutes. Can I have 10 minutes? No, you've already been up for 20. It's time to go. And that's that challenge. I think the biggest one is bedtimes always. Again, your plays, as I can't emphasize enough for you to really go over into your plays and review them. Their fears, the dark. They don't wanna go in a room dark. They don't wanna be alone. They'll come chasing for you. If they can't, you're not answering them. Of course, there's ghosts in my house. So I told Christian, um, could you please, when you see the ghost, tell him to come over to me. I wanna introduce myself. So I'll find out what is his name. So that sort of helped. And now he doesn't, not afraid of ghosts. Um, they're afraid that something's gonna happen to his penis or his testicles. And they don't like people who inflict pain. Nurses, doctors, okay? Sex education, um, they need to know what they're expressing. Um, you don't have to go into details completely, but find out what they know and then sort of add upon it. Again, using those correct anatomic words and be as honest as possible. It's very, very difficult. Now, masturbation is something that four-year-olds, five-year-olds, they do. One thing I would say is, you know, I've walked into a room where a child was like rubbing up against their stuffed animal and I realized what was going on. I said, you know, mom, I forgot something. I'll come back because you really shouldn't bring attention to it. It's absolutely a normal act. You don't want them to feel like they did something bad. So I walk out and I'll come back in, but it's normal. If they're playing in front of you in the living room, say, I go in your bedroom and take care of that and come back. And I know that sounds crazy, but it's probably the best thing to do because you've probably had your son do that to you. So fears again, same thing I've just discussed. So let's go for our cahoots. On that note, So there's a lot of information, a lot of different developmental stuff here. So let's go to the cahoots and now show you where you need to know the concepts of, okay? Is everybody in who wants to be in? All right, let's get started. <clears throat> Infant, toddler, preschooler, all the way up to age five. Which factor predisposes toddlers to frequent infections, ear infections, tonsillitis, and upper respiratory infections? So toddlers have these very large adenoids and tonsils in there and they obstruct mucus so it sits there. So it can go into the ears and go up the sinuses, et cetera, et cetera. So the answer is those short straight eardrums, um, ear structures and those tonsils are huge.
What type of play is considered cooperative play? So cooperative play is when you and another child, say two children get together and they plan what they want to do. And there's a goal you have to get to, which is playing checkers. That's how you win. It's not sharing. That's associative play. Okay. Checkers is there's a goal when you're done. You cooperate to do something together with something as an outcome. Okay. According to Kohlberg's pre-conventional level of moral development, a preschooler who has moral reasoning, what? Moral reasoning, Kohlberg. So Kohlberg is all about good and bad actions and that there's a good consequence or a bad consequence. Excellent, good job. Which nursing action is appropriate to teach a preschool age child about a scheduled procedure? They need to go in, they're gonna have outpatient surgery. What are you gonna to do to help them? Now this age, they're not trusting, You know, they still want mom around. How are you gonna get this done? <clears throat> we're gonna use a doll, but what we're gonna do first is get on their level, you know, don't do anything first, get on their level and then let them touch things and play with things and make things non-threatening. And the children do really well. Uh, Nicholas Children's does it to many of theirs. A multi-select. What are some findings from a pediatric physical assessment? Look at the question, physical assessment. What do you assess when you're doing a physical assessment? Remember there is a history and there is a physical, okay? So growth, yep, height, weight, we can touch it, feel it, review body systems. We're looking at, you know, their lungs, um, abdomen, et cetera, so perfect. Family history and symptoms are history. Good job. Before performing a physical assessment in a toddler, the nurse should do what to encourage cooperation? So we'll let them play, play, play as much as they want. Let them touch it, feel it, and get accustomed to it. Let them ask questions. Let them try it on you. And these kids will be great. What would you suspect if you note that an infant's chin is quivering, their fists are clenched, and they're inconsolable? Kids crying, 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 crying. Lips are quivering. <laughs> When you see this unconsolable, this fist clench and this chin just quivering, that's pain, absolutely pain. Um, could it be uh, colic maybe, okay? But it's absolutely pain. And you don't cry like that for your hungry. Just cry normally, it's not the chin. A multi-select. Erickson describes infants as trust versus mistrust. What does trust mean? The infants, it's trust versus mistrust. What does an infant trust? It's 
So we know that baby feels secure. We know that they can predict what's coming, their needs are met, and the infant, because of that, is a calmer, happier baby, because they only need to cry when they need something. A three-year-old child is having an outpatient procedure. How would you help the child to be less fearful? <clears throat> I think I drill this, this concept into you because it's probably one of the most important things in the practice of pediatrics is, you know, if you don't talk to a child, let them understand the way they learn about things, you're going to spend an hour doing something that could have maybe have taken you five minutes if you had a child, you know, um, educated to what was happening. So one thing I absolutely love about pediatrics, the child life who teach these children. You need to do an assessment on an infant and you walk into the room and the infant is asleep in the mother's arms. What are you gonna do? The infant is asleep in mommy's arms. So baby's calm. I'm going to listen to that lungs because there's no crying. They're not cooing. And I can also hear the heart really well there too. Um, the baby can sleep anytime um, when I want to do an assessment on them. It's, you'll get the best assessment that way. When do you switch formula to whole milk? So that's at one year. So that's the recommendation at one year, the baby's gotten all the nutrition that they need. They should be able to eat. I mean, many parents continue it, you know, but it's just a lot of extra calories. That's why the switch. And they want them to get the extra fat in the milk. Before assessing a four-year-old child, what techniques would you use to approach this child? Four years old. So you're going to go up and distract them about something. Oh, that you like Batman? Oh, I love Batman. Do you have one for Superman too? My grandson has one of them. Oh, those freckles. Oh, beautiful blue eyes, something. And that really does on a four-year-old will get them calmed down. Now you're not threatening. What technique can you use to examine a toddler? So it's all about play. When you talk about toddlers, you make play about it. And then, you know, it becomes very easy and you get a better assessment. When assessing a healthy child's lymph nodes, what would you expect? Kid comes in, just a normal, you know, yearly checkup. Doctor feels them. It's not sick. should not feel them at all, okay? When you feel them enlarged, the child is sick, okay? So you should not feel anything on a child who is healthy. Which Erickson stage of developmental levels would be used for a toddler? So toddlers love to do things for themselves and they don't want mommy to hold them back. Let mommy say, let me try. Let me bang my head once. <laughs> so it's autonomy versus shame and doubt. You need to know these. You will see these.
multi-select. Erickson's autonomy versus shame and doubt is used to describe toddlers. What does this mean? So it's all about doing things for themselves, trying new things. And the shame is when mom doesn't allow them to try and they should. Hardest thing for me was doing that. When walking into an exam room, you see a two-year-old rubbing a stuffed animal in their pubic area. What do you do? <clears throat> So you just let the child do what they're doing and just walk out and come back later. Don't bring attention to it because um, you don't want this child to have any problems mentally, you know, later on in their lives. <clears throat> A parent of an 18 month old boy says that he says no to everything and he has rapid mood swings. No, 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 no. An 18 month old. And he has temper tantrums. Can you imagine? Rapid mood swings. Absolutely normal for a toddler, isn't it? It's like having the lid off of a blender. I agree. What is descriptive of the preschooler's understanding of time? <laughs> preschoolers ages three to five. So the understanding is all about an event with the time. After dinner, we are going here. When you wake up in the morning, after lunch, when you wake up from your nap, that's what they understand. That's their event. Then they understand when they're going, not the number on the clock. A multi-select. How do you place a toddler on time out? Now, I had a crazy daughter-in-law who had two young three and one-year-old at the same time, and they came to visit, and she must have said it 50 times every day, what you're supposed to do. I think in the end, these children didn't understand because they weren't listening anymore because they get one minute per each age. You're on timeout because you hit your brother and the timeout doesn't start till you're sitting there quiet and don't say anything and stop crying. And she must have said that that day at least 50 times. It's that over and over again, you know, cause toddlers is that blender and she had two of them at the same time. So that's how you should um, for a toddler. A one month old's infant's back of their head is flat. What would you tell the mother? <clears throat> they got flat head because it's back to sleep today. So the only thing is because those scalps are really soft and they really re reshape very easily. Just place them on their tummy when they're wide awake and alert. We call it tummy time, right? And it does work. <clears throat> Infants crawl before they walk. This pattern of growth and development is called what? They lift their head, then they roll over, then they're on their knees, then they're going to creep, then they walk. What does that mean? What do we call that? <clears throat> And that is called sequential trends because it happens in a sequence. This should go to here, to here, to here, sequential. 
How do you communicate with parents that do not speak a language that you know? I walk in and my parents are Mandarin Chinese. What do I do? They have their family with them. And they're from the United States. They speak perfect English. And they absolutely cannot use a family member because they interpret what the parent says, not saying word for word what the parents responded. So always use, in this case, the telephone interpreters, those blue phones, as I call them. What age would most children can understand under, on top of, beside, around, over, under, and back of, or, you know, when do they understand those concepts? And don't think of your kids, okay? Because um, I know my grandson was not the age that's here, but remember, this is the book. This is the hardest thing about pediatrics when you have children. The answer is four years old. I mean, my grandson was doing it before he was three years. But you can't think about your kids. Hardest thing that you're going to have to do and to remember, it's the book. This is like in general, this is for all kids of all ages all over the place, okay? But they say four years. I was shocked with that too. In terms of language and cognitive development, a four-year-old should be expected to cognitive development, thinking, right? What should they be expected to do? <clears throat> Absolutely, just follow simple commands. Take your shoes, put them by the front door. Take your dirty laundry, put it in the hamper. Come on, let's go to the bathroom. We're taking a bath. Put your cup in the sink. Simple things they're able to do. They don't understand a person's perspective at all, not yet. They do the feelings, but not their understanding. They don't understand that there isn't a bottomless pit of apple juice in the house. That's the conservation of matter. And abstract, I mean, most of us are trying to figure out what abstract is. So absolutely not a four-year-old. How would you assess the pain of a toddler? Which scale? A toddler, ages one, two, three. And this is where we use the flax scales. And I give this question here because it's like consider preschooler. So after age three they would use the FACES scale. I put this question here because it's a question that's frequently misunderstood or misinterpreted. So understanding the pain scale flack is up to age three and FACES takes over preschool or three, four, five, okay? Multi-select. What safety instructions would you teach the parents of a six month old? Well, this question is asking you, what should a six month old child be able to do? And then what do you have to protect this child from? So of course it's still car seat is rear facing up to age two. Uh, electrical outlets are gonna start to get there. We are never going to introduce two foods at a time. It's always one, three to five apart. But that six month old now, remember, they can roll over completely. So don't leave them anywhere they can fall off, a couch, a sofa, anywhere. Nope, they will roll. A nurse receives a phone call about her six week old baby. He's crying a lot every day. What can she do? The parent wants to know, what can I do to help the baby stop crying? Well, the, the biggest information is the parent wants you over the phone to tell 
her what she can do to help her baby. They're crying a lot. Something's wrong. Is it colic? Maybe, but it could be something else. So absolutely, this infant, your best thing to tell her is either go to urgent care, go to somewhere, get medical help, go to the uh, come in for a visit if she can, or um, go in urgent care emergency room because something's not right and um, it needs to be evaluated. It can not, do nothing over the phone. That is a too young of a baby crying too much. A multi-select. What should an infant be able to do at nine months old? Well, you think about the string of events, right? So we lift our head, we turn front to back, back to front. Then we start crawling. Then we start creeping and then we start walking. So where? Which one? So at nine months old, they absolutely can hold that fine, uh, that, that fine motor skills, the rattle. Then we can pull themselves up on their feet and roll completely over. So very good, you caught them. Now sitting with support um, at nine months old, that should be there too. And you're absolutely right. I've got to change this question, sorry. 29. But yes, they should be able to sit. Oh, no, it's sit unsupported. I'm sorry. It's not sitting with support. It's sitting unsupported. An eight month old child should be able to do. So question was right. The first expected fine motor developmental milestone for an infant begins with fine motor for an infant. First thing, what do they do? So they should be able to do the reflex palmer. Reflex is just you touch it and they just squeeze. They don't know that they've done it. Then it goes to voluntary. Then it's pincher. And then it put objects in container and build a block of two by the age of one. Which statement about toilet training is correct? So we know that parents at this age, that children at this age love to please the parents. So that's always the number one. Now, bladder training is usually before bowel. So, you know, that could be a, an answer too. But the most important thing is that they're pleasing. They, they want to please mommy. They want to make her happy. They want the good praise. A toddler patient, a parent asked the nurse for suggestions on dealing with temper tantrums. Three-year-old, middle of the grocery store, it's on the floor, screaming, yelling. So again, ignore the behavior as long as it's not injurious, okay? That's all you can do. If you're going to talk to the child and give them a response to it, that's what they wanted. They wanted your attention. A two-year-old has difficulty in activity, sensory sensitivity, and has only speak one word responses. What do you assess this child with? Now, these are very um, clear things that looks like a, a child has problems with senses. Um, they don't like touch, lights, noises, and vocabulary is also very small. It's very much looking like a child who could be autistic. Now, when you see these things happening, you know, this is one of the tools we use to be able to help diagnose these children, you know, for autism and then get them the um, type of interventions they need to make them and help them be the best that they can be. Parents are concerned her eight month old is not developing like her older child. What's normal for eight months? 
An eight month old child should be able to do what? An eight month old child should be able to sit alone unsupported. They don't pull themselves up in the position, they're already sitting there. What fine motor skills is expected of a four year old child? Fine, remember fingers. So that fine motor is buttoning a shirt. That's the only thing there except shoelaces, but shoelaces is not till ages five. Walking upstairs, they should be able to do that by ages three. And then skipping, hopping, that's also a four-year-old should be able to do those things, but gross motor. Multi-select. What gross motor skills should a four-year-old be able to do? And I've separated the fine motor and gross motors because I want you to show you that there is a difference and how to think about it and remember what is the question asking for. So they should be able to go upstairs using both feet and they should be able to hop. As I said, jumping rope is uh, six, age six and tying shoelaces, it's like age five. Car seats can be safely switched to the forward facing position at what age? I did mention it earlier. So it's two years. Now I had a quandary because my grandson weighed 22 pounds at two years old. He was a peanut. So is it the weight or is it the age? And the answer is, is at two, their muscles are um, strong enough to be able to handle a car crash better than younger ones. That's why we wait till age two. It's not the weight, it is the age and cognitive development. Something I didn't know that I had to investigate. A second expected fine motor developmental milestone for an infant begins with what? Well, what's the first fine motor? And then you know the second. So it's a voluntary palm of grass. Starts with a reflex and then it goes to voluntary. Then it goes into crude pincher, pincher, put things out of containers and then build a block of two. All right, doing a developmental screening on a 10 month old should expect which fine motor skills from this infant. A 10 month old should be able to do what? So they should be able to grasp that rattle for sure. And then of course, use a pinch of grass to get foods off. Absolutely. Frequent developmental assessments are important for which reason? Like, why do we know this stuff? Why are, do we, are we needing to look at these things as we're doing our assessment on these children? It's because we are looking for those delays. And with delays, then we can look why, you know, if we need to do testing or we can do early intervention and get this child caught up to where they need to be. 
a multi-select. An infant searches for her toy that is not in sight. What is this called? It went over behind the toy and she can't see it. And the kids go looking for it, why? What is that called? It's called object permanence, right? And this is because of memory. They are starting to th remember things that are there. And as I said, you don't need mom there to find it. They can now sort of move around a little bit and they can reach and get it. So these things and object permanence are part of a infant's cognition learning. The natural physical sequence that most children follow is physical developmental sequence. It's part of gross motor also. They should lift their head up, roll over, creep, crawl, cruise, and walk, absolutely. And again, you can skip steps. It's just part of children. A multi-select. What would alert the nurse to hold the digoxin on an infant she's caring for? Now we'll be giving, you know, these medicines to children. You know, digoxin is a very common one on brand new infants. You know, but they can't tell you the things that adults do about the side effects of digoxin toxicity. <clears throat> So of course that heart rate low, that of 90, remember 140 to 160, it's 90, that's really low. Um, digoxin level 0 0.5 to two and it's 3.3. And of course low potassium will cause digitoxicity. So those three things are things we'd look. Sometimes in infants, you will not know any of this. The heart rate might be of a normal level, but the child, the infant starts vomiting. You have an infant who starts vomiting, who doesn't vomit normally. I'm gonna hold the digoxin and I'm gonna have the doctor order me a digoxin level. It could be that is the only symptom you see. So infants, you really have to be keen on your assessments. In general, an infant should triple their birth weight at about what months of age? So they double at six months, they triple at 12 months. Those are things you need to know. You will see them, whether it's incorporated in a question or alone. When an infant's toes spread when the soles of the feet are stroked, this is called, it's a great picture of it. <clears throat> And it's Babinski, just like it is for adults. You know, rooting, you know, is when you stroke the cheek and they go for it like they're going to feed breast or bottle. Startle or moro is when you noise or that you hit the crib and they legs come up and their hands go out. And grasping, we've discussed already. When entering an infant's room, the door slams shut and the infant jerks and starts to cry. What is that reflex called? And that is Moro, very good. I had just said it, good job. And they'll, you'll see them just jump, their hands and feet come right up. A four-year-old is reluctant to take medicine. What intervention should the nurse take? And this happens all the time. You know, and sometimes you know that the parent, um, you know, doesn't want to be dealing with it either. You know, and here's this four-year-old,
And what they say, you go through straightforward approach. Never put your medicine in food or juice. You don't know um, how much they took. They don't take all of it. And um, how much did they take when they took the medicine? So it is not approved. It's not said to do unless it's like this little bit of tiny just with a little bit that it's just one little spoon. Um, straightforward means, okay, you need to take medicine. Do you wanna chew a pill or would you like the liquid in a spoon or in a cup? That's it, straightforward. What do you want? I'm gonna get it for you. Um, and children sort of, well, I really don't have a choice here. They're not giving me a choice. And many times I can get them to take it. Which intervention helps a hospitalized toddler feel a sense of control? What do toddlers like? Control, that's something they know. In looking at that question, I, I, that's what I'm seeing. A toddler wants to be comfortable, stress-free, and we know it's that rituals, routines all the time, feeding, bedtime, everything. Put it the same, they're in control and they're a lot happier. And Arn is assessing a two and a half year old toddler, what findings should you report to the provider? What is not good? If you're reporting a finding to the provider, the doctor, something's wrong. Which of these is wrong? And it's the head circumference is bigger than the chest. You know, at birth, the heads are huge. But then about age two, the head should be equal to or less than the chest. So if it's still big, something's wrong. It needs to be investigated. A multi-select. What are risk factors for SIDS? So males are more than females. If they've just been sick, absolutely, that's a risk factor. Of course, that secondhand smoke is it. And actually breastfeeding decreases the risk for feed, for uh, SID. So breastfeeding is for preventative, not for have, you know, a child that might be SIDS. What does the rooting reflex enable the infant to do? Rooting, what's rooting? So when you stroke the cheek, the baby was looking for something to put in its mouth. So breast or bottle fed. In fact, sometimes when they don't want to breastfeed, you take and stroke the breast on the chin and they come right around and they grab it. A multi-select. A child's been admitted with profuse diarrhea for two days. What would you expect? Now, I've noticed that the HESI loves acid-based questions. So I'm trying to infer these into your, um, you know, your cahoots that you see them. So metabolic alkalosis, and of course, you're losing a lot of liquid. You always think of hypokalemia. So very good. An infant's not able to take breast or bottle feedings. What's important to remember? So you have an infant who cannot eat. Their, you know, whatever, their tummy is tender or um, they've got a breathing tube or oxygen and they can't go into surgery. What do you need to remember for, for growth and developmental purposes? And that's, 
when you have a child, an infant, remember, how do they self-soothe? And that's that pacifier, oral, right? Pacifier, they can suck and bite and chew it, and that gives them comfort. And it keeps them in that growth and development so that when they are ready to eat normally, that they're able to, because they know they've been practicing. What does an infant start to do at three months? What do they start to do at three months? They start to roll, you know, one way or the other way they're rolling. So um, be watching for that when you're examining them also. I've seen them roll off. An infant's first form of communication is what? How do they talk to you? Infants, two weeks old, how are they talking to you? One day old, one, one second old, how are they talking to you? And yes, they're crying, they're cooing, and this is a part of the way they communicate their needs and get their trust. Hannah, number three, good job. Number two, Jillian, good job. Number one, do, 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 do. Janaya, good job, guys. Number four, Jordan and Jess. Okay, good job. Now I want you to sign your attendance attestations. Make sure that they are done because if you don't do them, you um, could possibly not have your two points of reference in the Canvas per week. Uh, last week, there were some this weekend that I had to go through. I mean, like the responses I got were so quick. Um, I do tend to go look and I do send you a little message, please sign them. And that's the reason why I don't want anybody dropped because you know, you don't have it signed. And if it's because you missed and you have to write a little something for me, you can sign it while I'm waiting. You know, I don't want, you know, those things to happen to any of you. So it's been a great class, um, getting you out right on time. So you all have a great evening, okay? I will be sending these things, oh, by noon tomorrow, okay? Have a great evening. And I'll be sending the study guides out by Friday at the latest. So you'll have them. You can print them and look at them and be prepared. And Ms. Bogart, if you can just hang on so I can speak with you real yes, quick. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you.